students taking sides over Israel and Gaza. People my age get their information from social media, which can be often misleading. A South Florida student government's demands prematurely public. I'm not prepared to, to say anything about what we might do on a resolution that may or may not you know, even pass. What South Florida's premier public university wants you to know. Special election day in South Florida. A vacant seat in the state house. Who will voters send? The Democrat. I'm a working family man. The Republican. There's certainly more work to be done. Or the candidate with no party and no visible campaign. I do things differently. All three here live for the debate. Do you know enough about the candidates? Uh, no. I mean, which ones? The race to replace a mayor. Organize the process. Small city, big drama. It's not taxpayer money. One candidate under scrutiny. I served you know, on that for a long time. The other with us live. The big news of the week and the newsmakers all live this week in South Florida. Good morning, good morning. Welcome. I'm Glenna Milberg. We begin with what may be an unprecedented public statement this week from Florida International University's board chair and its president ahead of a student government resolution vote. That student document, that resolution, calls for a ceasefire by Israel in its war against terrorists and uses loaded language, words like oppression, regime, and genocide. It suggests the university statements last month standing against Hamas and terror and with all people who stand against terrorism were not enough. That student government resolution has a committee process to go through before it's signed, but the public preview of it raised serious concerns in the community, enough to prompt FIU's president and board chair to get out in front of it. Board of Trustees Chair Roger Tovar is right here at the table to talk with us about it all. And it is so nice to have you on a Sunday morning. Grateful for your time here today. Glenna, thanks for having me. Uh, it, it really is a pleasure to be here. And it's a pleasure to be here representing FIU. It's my alma mater two times over. I know it's yours. One time over. <laughs> One time over. Uh, you know, FIU is a university with 57,000 students, 10,000 faculty and staff. And so, yes. Uh, Can I ask you the question first? Go ahead. <laughs> okay. All right. I want to talk about a small percentage of that student population. And the student government that drafted this resolution, which is not yet signed, and to the uh, President Jessel said he didn't really want to comment on it because it wasn't. Fair enough. Fair point. Why did you feel it was necessary to write this statement to the community? I, I think that's a fair question, and I think uh, most of the time we would not be commenting on anything that's coming in front of SGA. But I think it's important for the public uh, to realize uh, how universities operate. There is a student government. It's a self-governing body. Independent. Independent of the university, although there is some oversight. Uh, the board uh, does not get involved in student government affairs. Um, but this resolution was brought forward by less than a handful of senators. So within student government, there's a legislative branch, there's a judicial branch, and there's an executive branch. Uh, resolutions come through, uh, and there was three senators, from my understanding, that drafted this resolution, and uh, it, it, it was going to go through its process, and it may go through its process. And, and we'll see what the outcome is. But the, the resolution was distributed throughout the community. Yes. And, I had, and, and Local 10 did a, a news report about it. There was, yeah. there was numerous uh, reports on it. Yeah. And so uh, numerous people reached out to me and wanted to say, why does FIU have this position? And so I, I thought it was important, President Jessel thought it was important, that we put out a statement that we in the administration, him as the president, I as the uh, chair of the board, uh, in no way uh, believe that what is on that resolution is the position of our university and the majority of the people at our university. So I want to, since you bring it up, and because it's not out there yet, and I want to be very clear that this, there's no there there except for a document that is about to be signed. 
Uh, and so that's why I think it's worthy to talk about it because of the controversy around it. And the resolution itself, it's what, like nine pages long or maybe a little longer. Passion and politics, they are what they are. And we have plenty of those. Facts are facts. And this particular resolution does have some factual errors, some inaccuracies, some historical inaccuracies. And it's footnoted, you know, the re research done, the footnotes mostly are pro-Palestinian, some blogs and authors. And it asks the university some very specific asks right. to, you know, generally speaking, to collaborate and compromise and work with the the student government signees to be. And and how do you how will you address that? Well, first of all, if, if I could correct, uh, you say it's going to be signed. I don't know that it will be signed. P pending um, a signature. Uh, uh, the the resolution needs to go through a number of committees, uh, and then we'll see if it is signed. Um, but, but as far as what you're saying, you're 100% right, and that's what concerned me greatly, is to see, uh, number one, what is written in that resolution, because if you just read the title, it says ceasefire. Now, I, I think that's an oversimplification as to what is going on in Israel. Yeah. Then as you go through some of the statements that they made, they're very concerning, and, uh, and, and then if you go through the citations, I, I think that's, a lot of the problem that, that uh, every place in society is encountering, that you can go onto the internet and you can cite, uh, you can find something to support something that you want to say is a fact when it's not a fact. And so, again, uh, the resolution, uh, we support student body, we support for them to be able uh, to have dialogue, debates, and everything else. But as us as the leadership at FIU, we wanted to make sure that we were clear that that resolution does not reflect the position of the president, of the board, or of the majority of the FIU community. The student government, to your point, a wholly separate organization Absolutely. with its own rights and its own freedoms Absolutely. and its own responsibilities from the university. Is there any crossover, is there a uh, faculty advisor maybe, is there um, a, a mechanism where the university works with SGA on issues? And, and I guess part two of that question is, on this subject, has anybody in the university, I hate the word liaised, but I just can't think of another one at the moment, liaised <laughs> with them? <laughs> there, there, there is a vice president of student affairs, and, and so there is uh, oversight, uh, but, but they have their process. And keep in mind, again, I'll repeat, there was three senators that drafted this resolution. I believe there's a total of 47 senators within student body. So um, to tell you I would know what the outcome is or what the feelings are of the other 44 senators, I don't. Uh, to say that I'm trying to influence uh, how they run student government, I am not. But I am going to make a statement. I will not sit silently by when I see a document that is full of, uh, uh, of false statements backed up by websites from who knows where. Uh, and for people in this community, and many of them which are, are hurt by that statement, by this resolution, to think that this is the position of FIU, I will not be silent. The, um, we've seen news reports from campuses around the country, uh, some Ivy League, some not. There have been rallies. There have been some ugliness on those campuses. There's been administrators who really have not taken this kind of stand. FIU has not seen, we've seen rallies, all peaceful. Um, no South Florida university or college has seen any of that kind of chaotic environment. Why do you think that is? Because we have the most amazing students in this country. <laughs> but uh, I kind of threw and, that one and, up. You yeah, hit it you, out of the You park. did. You did. But we, we really do. Uh, if you go to college campuses throughout this country, our student body is different. Our student body, a lot of them are first gen. Uh, there's a uh, 70, 75 percent uh, happen to be minorities, uh, but they're just amazing students. And so uh, I, I think everything I've seen uh, there is debate, there is dialogue, but it's done in a very respectful way. Uh, so I, I will tell you I'm proud of our students. I'm proud to be 
uh, again an alumni. I'm proud to be associated with FIU, as are you. And uh, so uh, that's why we're not seeing that at FIU. And now and, you're the board chair? And I'm the board chair. Head honcho, and, uh, top guy. Well, I don't know I about head honcho, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, I'm passionate about what we do yeah. and uh, the opportunity that we provide to our students. Yeah. So nice to have you here. I hope you will come back and we absolutely will be following the trajectory of whatever happens here. Glenna, thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right, special election day is Tuesday. A vote for one new state representative for South Florida and all three candidates are right here together for the first time to debate and that's next. Special election season part two comes Tuesday when voters in various zip codes will elect a new mayor and a new state representative. If last month's special elections in Miami and Miami Beach are any indication, everyone who does vote gets outsized power to decide because so few people likely will. Our job here is to do all we can to empower you with information. And so today we start with the race for that state house seat, District 118. That's a slice of Miami-Dade from Sweetwater to Cutler Bay, give or take a few miles. Of course, this, this election is actually critical to everyone outside the District 2 because, you know, in Tallahassee, party math dictates what issues win or lose. All three candidates running are here together to get into some of that business. And so introductions first. Johnny Farias is the Democrat in the race. He is running again for this seat, an electrician by trade, business owner, and former community councilman. Mike Redondo is a Republican, an attorney specializing in personal injury and a first time political candidate and construction executive Frank de la Paz running independent, no party affiliation. Wow, all three, which means there's no primary because the results will be the results. So Tuesday, one of you becomes mm -hmm. state representative elect. You've been here. You've been here. You have not. I'm so happy you're here and I want to give you the first question. Right. Because if anyone who watches Local 10 knows, we've chatted at your front door a couple of times. That's and cool. um, if you look at the financials and the support, you have no money that we can see. I don't know what we can't see. We have no money. You told me you were prepared to spend about $10,000 for this. What, where is it? What happened? We got two days to go. I did, uh, I did tell you that. Then I changed my mind. But I have reached the goal that I wanted. Which is? To be able to bring out to the people the fact that we had an election, that it was a, a sneaky election as far as I could tell. Sneaky? Yes, the way this election was designed, it was in a sneaky way for nobody to notice that there was an election. <laughs> so my candidacy was there from the beginning to make sure we had an election and that those words would come out. Johnny, because... Johnny, do you agree? Is this a sneaky election? I mean, it's the, a special election. The timing was a little off, but I mean, I want to say Steve, but the timing is it, kind of funny because they waited till you know at the last day, and the governor decided to do it when the, uh, when the lawsuit was filed, and then to do it a week after Thanksgiving when it should have been in November. Oh, so you opinion. you are ascribing the governor kind of waited too long to yes. call this election. Absolutely, you, the governor being a Republican. I'm going to turn to the Republican candidate. Do you have that same feeling? Yeah, no. On, I mean, for my part, I think obviously it's a special election. Um, there are other special elections going out throughout the state that are on even, you know, different dates from ours. So I, I can't say I know the exact reasons why, but I certainly don't think it was something that people, you know, weren't aware of at the time. There's, well, people who are generally not engaged in the political world probably didn't realize there was an election on Tuesday, which is why I'm glad we're all here. I want to talk about, the, you know, reporting 101 on campaigns is you follow the money. And, you know, I think candidates sometimes find that problematic. I'm not quite sure why, because it is what it is, and anybody can look up the financials. But I, I want to start with you, because you do have the most money in this race. And if you look up, you have um, a lot of party support. I mean, a, the bulk of your contributions. Clearly, the Republican Party of Florida wants you to have that seat. And, and I wonder if you can address that, that component of a first-time candidate with so much party support are you, you know, you're going up to be a party guy or are you going up to be your own guy? No, no question about that. It's obviously, I think one of the questions you asked me at the last interview was if there was a bill that I thought was bad for my district but leadership supported, I, I would not support that bill. I mean, obviously, um, I'm very fortunate to have my party support. 
Um, but it's also, as you mentioned, I mean, this is an important race because in Tallahassee, I'm going to be one of 120, but it is a game that requires, it's a team sport, you know, and having uh, the ability to work with the party that, you know, is, is an important thing for any representative. And so uh, I don't view it as a negative at all, but I, I'm certainly not going up to be a party man, you know, a yes man, so to speak. I, I think I call that the uh, party math. <laughs> and, the, and the party math right now in Tallahassee, no surprise, is that Republicans outnumber Democrats two to one. I don't think there's a, a no party affiliate in the House uh, of Representatives no, or the, the Senate, right? No, he's not. You, you might be the first. Um, Johnny, so you've amassed uh, a war chest of sorts. Your, it's a very different pattern than we see for the Republican candidate. You have yes. mostly grassroots support. You have, you have someone who contributed $8 to your campaign. Yes. Um, and so I, I wonder if you were a little daunted by the, I, I did not see a contribution from the Democratic uh, Party of Florida. I do see they were phone banking and supporting you. Mm -hmm. Is that daunting to you? In a little way, but look, um, I mean, let's call it spade a spade. When you have my Republican opponent that has $145,000 of special interest, we know where the interest is going to lie. I, I know $54,000 from regular people. When I have $84,000 for regular people, I'm going to owe the regular people that have donated and that I'm going to represent. You know, um, for me to say that I owe anybody nothing, I only owe the people. I'm not going to worry about the special interest because at the end of the day, we all know two fish, they're going to come knocking on the door. I want to ask the no party affiliate, no party backing, and no contributions. Still in the race, though, with two days to go. You, you hear what Johnny said about being beholden. You've heard what Mike said about I'm my own guy and I, you know, you need money to run a race, or, or do you? I don't know. Um, do you think it's possible as a no party affiliated uh, candidate to have money, to take money f with support and not owe people anything? Yes, it's possible, and especially if, uh, if the race will have been called in November, the numbers will be differently, and what, what, what we will that? be talking about differently. This race, as I stated from the beginning, was designed, from the genesis, it was designed for the Republican candidate, uh, the party, the state party, and he knows very well who I'm talking about, uh, Mr. Danny Perez, the upcoming uh, chair, went around and told everybody else that even have filed for next year, get out of the way. We got somebody else, and they went and got somebody else out of the district that has not been living in the district, came in and says, you're going to be the party candidate. And that was often designed from the DeSantis group. It's not even the whole Republican. We got Republicans in the, on the state who are not in favor of this. And unfortunately, that's the way it's playing now, and the media did not cut on it except for maybe you because <laughs> uh, say, even the, the Herald Board of uh, uh, decided to do an interview right after Thanksgiving when nobody was even in town. Let, let me uh, let me take that allegation and assertion to the person you are directing it at and give you a chance to respond. Sure, it's it's news to me. I mean, uh, I wish someone would have told me that this was going to happen for Were me. Were you recruited for this? No, absolutely not. And it's one of the things and that's that... that's not a pejorative if you no, were. No, no, yeah. And, and it's interesting because, yeah. you know, um, I, I was born and raised in the district. I've been, my father in particular was always very, very, I used to watch C-SPAN with my dad growing up as a kid. And nerd so, alert, nerd alert. Yeah, big time, unfortunately. <laughs> so I, uh, you know, I always had an interest in politics. It was more just an up. It's not every day that we have a sitting state representative get appointed to a new position and then there's an open seat. Yeah. Johnny, um, what Frank is talking about is not news to people in politics. It's a game and it's played that way. And the more people who can play the game well are successful. What you know, my job is public service and informing the public. So let's just peel back the layers of that and let them know this is what goes on. Oh, you've run for this seat before. Right. What did you learn from this uh, that time to this time? Well, one of the things I learned is that you can't say that you weren't recruited and you get one hundred forty-five thousand dollars for special interest. I, I mean, I mean, when you say special <laughs> interest, you are talking about what? Party lobbyist, uh, you know, all special interests that has given money. I mean, you can go. I actually printed out the report. You know. You can't say that. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Michael Redondo. I'm, you can't say that you weren't recruited when you had that much money, okay, from a special interest, and not even from the district. And furthermore, over just to what uh, what Frank said, you even said in, a, in an interview, you just moved back here six months ago. So yeah, you're not from the district. You know, it, it, you know, you're, you're don't know what the issues are when it comes to grow, raising a family in the district. You don't know what the problems are with kids going through high school, going through college. You, you just don't. You know, I, I just, you, in fairness, you sure. need to respond. Yeah. Um, 
I, I can tell everyone I am not lying. I am telling you the truth. You can take my word for it or you can trust my opponent, but I can certainly tell you I was born and raised in the district. I went to Calusa Elementary. Um, I don't really know <laughs> where this idea uh, is coming from, but. Well, I'll tell you what, why don't we take a break because sure. I would love to talk about some issues that are important to all three of you. So Absolutely. let's take a quick break and we will be right back. We are back with all three candidates for the House District Race 118 in Miami-Dade and of course important to everybody watching as well because state issues are important. Um, you weren't with us, Frank, last time we were here right after qualifying. Uh, my Democrat and Republican in the race were and both of you identified property insurance to your constituents uh, as the number one. Let me start with you. The State House, the State Senate did a lot on property insurance, uh, tried to right the market. I'm mm -hmm. giving you the headline. Right now, it's too soon to say how far it'll write it in the near future, but costs are rising, to your point, and you all know that, and people are hurting. And what more, I want you to address what was done and what are you going to take to Tallahassee to advance that help for constituents? Sure. I mean, I think, as you mentioned, there was a pretty significant legislative package that was passed. Um, that is going to take time to come into effect, but as I mentioned before, there is more work to do. I think the insurance industry really got essentially everything they were asking for in terms of what they mentioned uh, that the issues were. Um, premiums have not been coming down yet, and so I think we need to make sure that additional legislation is focused on. What uh, does that look like? Well, addressing the reinsurance market, I think, is a critical part. Um, you know, we do live in a giant peninsula out in the Atlantic Ocean, so um, we do need to have a robust reinsurance market. I think that's a critical piece to help attract new carriers uh, to the state, but we also need to make sure that we're having uh, holding insurance companies accountable to the to the you know commitments they made to their policyholders and making sure that regulations are in place that now that we have this legislative package that gave the insurance industry what they wanted let's make sure that they're continuing to uh, keep those promises to our constituents and again making sure that they're not just choosing the best parts of Florida to write policies in but not you know staying around when it comes down to it when our policyholders need them Johnny okay well to add what you said that the legislature did a lot about nothing because the only thing they did was raise uh, on premiums and it is affecting us right now which shows how much people are out of touch because just the other day when I was at homeowner association people getting ready to lose their homes because their association went from paying like 200 some thousand dollars to almost four hundred thousand dollars. What are you taking to Tallahassee right. and and as a member of the minority party at this moment mm -hmm. in time how how do you think you will move that needle? Well what the, the, the needle should move because this should be a a problem that the Republican wants to fix because people lose their homes. Um, the reinsurance thing, and I said it the last time, and I keep saying it, we need to fix the reinsurance problem by cutting it to 20% because right now your premium that you pay is 40% of that goes to reinsurance. Reinsurance is insurance for the insurance industry. Yes. Frank, what do you think? Well, I <clears throat> definitely we have a large issue with insurance. And besides everything that has been done, what we also have to do is bring not new carriers to the state. We have plenty of carriers that have chosen not to write in Florida, yet they advertise every day how they bundle homeowners and auto. Well, let's bring them to the table. Let's put a stop to those false, false advertising that we're seeing every day from a State Farm, Geico, Prudential, from the big boys. And if you're going to advertise bundles, start offering the products. Bring those companies to the table and start offering products so we have a broader a spread of where to put the risk. If, if you get a seat in that state house as a no party affiliated representative, how do you think, um, how are you going to play that game and get Democrats and Republicans well, to Well, to both sides, that, that, you don't need a new legislature just to tell the big boys you're doing false advertising. All you have to do and is girls. the state attorneys and the girls. But when I mean the bo big boy, I don't know an insurance company that is owned currently by a woman, but there might be one. But let's bring them to the table and say, stop this false advertising. If you want to offer insurance for homeowners, offer them, but don't be misleading us. And bring them into the table to start having a conversation. Those companies could do a lot of good to start spreading that risk. Not relying on new companies that will be here only for three years and go bust. Let, let me throw out, I know Fra Frank and I had talked about the Live Local Act, which 
is in effect. Uh, cities like Miami Beach, like Doral, have already raised red flags that a very well-intentioned effort to bring affordable housing to teachers and police officers and, and uh, sort of like a, what would they would call the middle class to afford to live in South Florida, also takes cities and communities' decision-making away from them, and, and, and some find that very problematic. Uh, District 118 is going to be greatly affected by this. What, what are your thoughts on that? So I think, you know, the classic problem, the NIMBY, not in my backyard, is the, the acronym people use. And, and that's exactly what we see with some of the elements of Live Local Act. It's that people, I think everyone is in favor of having more affordable housing. But the challenge becomes when individual municipalities, you know, when their local zoning laws are in place and it doesn't allow for that to occur, that's when the state had to come in and step in and pass the Live Local Act. I think, again, unfortunately, all of these are very fairly new developments. The issues on the beach and in Doral are, are sort of the, the first Test case. Um, yeah, first test cases we're seeing. I, I do think that it was not only well intentioned, I do think it will lead to more affordable housing. It's just going to take some time, but um, it may be something that has to be tweaked down the road. But right now, I mean, we, it is an urgent need and it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Do you agree? Um, okay, and I'm glad you mentioned that as a community councilman, I don't like that at all. And the, the thing that why that was done, it wasn't because to, to get more affordable housing. It was for the governor and the powers that be to take away home rule from Dade County. So you don't think it will, uh, will no, create affordable housing? No, but no, because one, as a community councilman, that's one of the things that, 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 that we were at the table for, to make sure that, that when a, a plan came ahead in front of us, that it was built correctly and for the community. Okay, there is a lot of land still here in Dade County. Yeah. And, and I know because I was in the community council. So we didn't need that. Just like we didn't need to move the UDB around to-, to, to Urban development. Boundary. Yeah, we didn't need that. I, I know you, you and I talked, you're against it. I'm totally against it. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, it's taken away the home rule. It's, lo it's taken away local opinion to the re redevelopment that is much needed. We do need affordable housing, but there has to be some guidelines that we have taken away from the local communities. Now, we're going to be seeing in the current, uh, on the next few months, a five-story building in, in horse country, which is sacred ground for multifamily. Well, they're sticking it in there. We're going to see 640 apartments on town and country, Kendall Drive, 117th Avenue, where you have a continuous 24-hour traffic jam, and nobody can oppose it. Potentially, even Calusa Country Club, instead of having 500 homes, now we can have 12,000 I Townhouses. I that is crazy without any local input. I remember you told me that that might have been the reason you actually entered this race. It is race. one of the reasons, yeah. being having been a member of the community council, having been involved with zoning and land use. Yeah. But then I recognize that you got to have some control. Yeah. Um, I have one more question for you, but we have to take a quick break. So let's do that and we'll be right back. We are back with the candidates for 118, and in the short time we have together, I want to throw out one of those issues that they'll call a culture war issue, because there's a lot of them in, in Tallahassee, and they're important to people. Um, Frank De La Paz, an NPA, this week, it's in the news in Broward County Public Schools, a volleyball player who is a trans girl is no longer allowed to play. Uh, there have been student walkouts over it. Principal and a couple of staff members have been reassigned while they investigate how this case comports with the 2021 law that mandates biological gender to play ball in high school. Frank, um, weigh in on that, uh, the law and its application to Broward, and what do you think? Personally, in as much as it might go against my personal beliefs, religious and otherwise, that's one of the samples that is uh, Tallahassee gone wrong, sticking their nose on local issues. Uh, that is specific, and some of the other ones that they have been passing in the last few years, the state legislature should stay out of it. That should be up to the local boards. That's why we have local school boards to make local decisions according to the community. And what might be acceptable in Broward may not be acceptable in Ocala, and that's fine, but that's the intent of having local elections. Now to have the state come in and say, this is how we're gonna do this, how we're gonna do sports, the books that we're gonna read, and how families should make decisions on their own bedrooms, that's none of the state business. That should be up to local boards 
and the state should not be forcing those mandates on the state boards. Uh, so, Johnny, Farias, um, just the House of Representatives is made up of people elected from local districts like 118. What do you think? You know, I'm, for once, I'm going to say I'm actually on board with La, um, Frank Labas in this one. Um, we need to let the school board handle these situations. Yes, um, the state legislature does have some say, but you know, it, it's a, you know, you got to take in consideration the safety issues, the 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 issues with, with the person that that's on the, on the sports team. So I say, let the school board. That's what we, that's what we have a school board for. Let them make those decisions and let the state worry about people losing their homes because of insurance. And yet, it is a state law. Has been for two years. Mike, would you do something to change that? No, I think uh, obviously, uh, of course, we need to have local uh, decision making involved in some of these things. But when it comes to protecting our kids and making sure that we have uniform guidelines, we can't have guidelines that exist in Dade County. And then when that team goes to play a team in a regional championship with against Broward, you have different rules. So. Uh, particularly on this issue, I think it's one that, um, you know, it is something appropriate for the state to have set some uniform guidelines and there's still absolutely opportunities for local school boards and the like uh, to have say. But on that issue in particular, I do think it's, it's primarily about making sure that there's fair and safe rules for both, uh, you know, male and female uh, participants in sports. And I think it was an appropriate use of uh, state law. Uh, okay, we have less than two minutes left, a little bit of a lightning round. Um, abortion shaping up to be a national issue for 24, certainly a state issue as we wait to see what a court says and if the current 15 week limit on abortion in Florida becomes a six week, if it goes through, uh, signs are that there might be a bit of a push in Tallahassee to even go further. Would you um, support that effort? Uh, I'm not aware of the specific efforts to go beyond that, but I, what I will say is I think abortion is an issue that has divided us for far too long. I think we need to stop judging people based on this issue and more provide support. Um, we should encourage women to view alternatives to abortion, but we also need to provide more support for single mothers and young women who are becoming parents and don't have support. Um, so I think we need to focus more on those issues and trying to support people both before and after pregnancy um, than it is about trying to divide us after the fact. Do you support a six week ban? I think the, the current limit. Uh, the current state law as passed, I think, is something that was appropriate for for uh, for the state of Florida. Johnny, I support women's choice, especially when you have um, people like Mike Rodano that wants to be a representative who don't have children telling my daughter what to do with her body. Frank, I'm totally against the current law. I think the state should stay, uh, be totally out of it. That's a private issue that should not be governed. How long have you been? In, uh, thank you. How long have you been an NPA? Uh, probably about 10 years now since uh, I was Republican until the last Bush election. Frank De La Paz, the independent in the race, Johnny Farias, the Democrat in the race, Mike Redondo, the Republican in the race, District House 118. Somebody on Tuesday will be the winner of that, and uh, we appreciate your time, and I hope we gave people a little glimpse into your minds and hearts and possible votes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. All right, next we have another special election Tuesday, this one in North Miami Beach, and you will meet one of those candidates coming up. We turn now to another election on Tuesday, the race for mayor of North Miami Beach. This is a small city with big drama and dysfunction, and that makes what's happening there so relevant to everyone in South Florida, where governments may operate without enough attention from residents. This week, days away from that vote, we found the election and the candidates running were pretty much a mystery to potential voters. No, I didn't know I voted. From Miami Beach or? For North Miami Beach, for mayor. Oh, okay. Well, I didn't know that. Do you know about the candidates? Not Do you know enough about the candidates? Uh, no. I mean, which ones? Well, the ones named Evan Piper and Paule Villard, both former NMB commissioners vying to step into the role as mayor. Villard has not responded to our calls or invitations, not for this and actually not ever. Evan Piper is with us to get into some of those issues. Evan Piper, welcome to the program. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, honored and grateful to be here today. <laughs> we are honored and grateful to have you. So you've been a commissioner. You were um, also on plan was it the Planning and Zoning Board. You've been involved in civic issues. Why, why run for mayor now? 
Well, that's a good question. Um, but really, the, the, the true answer is, is that um, North Miami Beach is a city that I've lived in for most of my life, a city that I love, and a city that I've always been involved in. Um, planning and zoning board, chamber of commerce, all those things. So I've been, I'm always keeping an eye on the political uh, climate of the city. And I saw that the political climate was starting to decline over the last several years. Um, in the last year, I started to see things start moving in the right direction. Um, and then we had an issue where um, something happened with our former mayor and there was a vacancy on the commission. And I felt that um, it was time for me to step back up again, feeling that I'm, I'm one of the few, if only, candidates that have the knowledge and experience to step in on day one and, and make a huge difference. So I am going to sort of be a bit more blunt about some of the things you just talked about over the years of a decline. I think you called it a decline in the political atmosphere. Um, the mayor was arrested and suspended for voting in a house he didn't live in, which is why there's a vacancy. But other than that, there have been commissioners that don't show up for commission meetings and hamstring business. And, and I wonder, it, as a longtime uh, observer of politics after you were in it, why is this? What has happened in this city where there is such dysfunction? What is the root cause of that? I, I believe that what has happened is there has become a, a big line of division in the city. And, and I think that that is the overlying problem is that things don't happen unless you work together as a team. And if you are fundamentally divided, it makes it really, really difficult to form that team. And that's where I believe I can step in and help. What is the division? Is it, this is a nonpartisan role, it's a nonpartisan commission. Is there politics, a political division? Is there, are there issues that people don't agree on? Where does the compromise need to be? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of it is that there's um, different point of views that, um, that you know, different commissioners have. And I think that's really what creates it. And I just don't think that there's been the person involved there that's been able to pull it together. Like, for example, with me, um, of course, I was 25 years on the planning and zoning board in North Miami Beach, um, most of that time as chairman. I I'm currently the president of the North Miami Beach Chamber of Commerce. I have relationships with all of the sitting commissioners in the city right now. I've Some of them I've had relationships for years and years. Some of them I've had relationships for the last several years but all good relationships. And I believe that I can be that conduit that can bring everybody together really by just listening to everybody, taking everybody's point of views into consideration and respecting those, and, and really just trying to um, be fair and unite everybody, and most of all, be respectful to everybody and their views. What do you consider uh, to be North Miami Beach's most pressing issue right now? I suspect what your answer is going to be something that everyone in every other city might be able to relate to, but but I'm curious to see what, what your priority is. So the way, that, the way that I see it and the way that I plan to um, attack this issue is first and foremost, I think it's the lack of unity, which is like the global overlying problem that we have in the city. So first and foremost, I believe that we need to unify the commission. That'll trickle down into the city staff and create more unification there and also create unification amongst the residents. Now, once we have some of that in place, now we could start rolling up our sleeves and looking at some of these big, harder problems. Um, for example, um, we've had like a budget shortfall in this, you know, in the past budget season and we need to work on that. So I've got a plan for that, which, you know, really with all my years of business experience, this really comes down to business 101. And, and it's really, we need to eliminate our wasteful spending. We need to make sure that 
We're not wasting money as a city. And then we need to come back and create more revenues for the city, which I do have a plan for as well. What has been the source of wasteful spending? Why is there a budget shortfall? I think it's a it's a combination of things that have happened over you know over several years. Um, it's you know it's hard to put a exact finger on exactly one thing. You know it is a combination, but they're definitely. Give me um, an example. Has, Just a, for instance, one. What's the first and second one? Well, I mean, there's been some there's been some um, spending habits that have happened. You know, an excessive amount of um, city events. Um, an excessive amount of um, giveaways that were not really um, for the social purpose that they should have been for. Um, and, and it goes on and on. There's been things where, you know, departments in the city um, have been outsourced. There's, uh, you know, we, we do pay some excessive fees to our outsourced um, vendors. So there's just, um, it's just a combination of a lot of areas where we have a lot of bleeding. So you are a, I, we mentioned that this was a nonpartisan race, um, nothing that Democrats nor Republicans need to do here. And you are a, a registered NPA, no party affiliated person. Yep. Um, and yet the Florida Democratic Party has been getting some calls and uh, interest in backing your opponent. And I wonder, if you as an NPA, you know, North Miami Beach actually has a sizable number of very progressive thinkers, Democrats, and a sizable population of conservative thinkers. As, as a no party affiliate in a technically nonpartisan election, speak to those very different thinkers about how you can bridge that. Yeah, well, you know, I think, and, and particularly at the municipal level, I think what's really important is to make sure that the candidate that you know let, let's just say the best person for the job the person that has the most experience and the best ability to make the job get done the right way is really what's most important i think that a lot of um, residents overlook the importance of municipal elections and and how really that does affect their everyday life more so than the the other levels of government are you surprised? I don't know if you you were able to see either the report we did during the week or just in the run up to this segment. Uh, did a little sort of vox pop, man on the street interviews, woman on the street interviews. We didn't find many people who even knew that there was an election. One we found did and didn't know who the candidates were. Does that surprise you? Um, it, it it is, but it isn't. I mean, it shouldn't be that way because when people need something done, they certainly know how to make that known. But on the other hand. They, they're not proactive about making sure that they do the things that are needed to get things done when they need things done. And that really starts with being aware of your local elections, your local elected officials, because they're the ones that are going to help you when things aren't happening in your own city or, or county or what have you at the local level. And that's, we try to do that here pretty much every day as well. Evan Piper, <laughs> great to have you on the program. And Tuesday is the election for all of you voters in North Miami Beach. And uh, we certainly appreciate your time. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Okay. And we will be right back. To rewatch today's interviews or listen to the South Florida This Week in South Florida podcast, here's the QR code that takes you right to the This Week in South Florida section of Local10.com. You're such a big part of this program. We want to hear your thoughts, email or social media, any way you want at Glenna WPLG. Have a beautiful Sunday and keep in touch.